Mm -hmm. All right, we are live. <laughs> Y'all don't want to know what happened the last five minutes. <laughs> We're good at releasing the movies and stuff, but the technical stuff, maybe not so good. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here with my uh, Orthodox brother, Father Nicholas Lowe. Um, a lot of you know him from uh, his church in Jacksonville, St. John of the Divine. He wrote the book that I always tell you that I love so much, Renewing You. And he was kind enough to ask me to write one of the recommendations or forward, whatever you call it. And I remember when he sent me the book, I thought, okay, you know, I, I didn't know what it was going to be. I got, I, think, I got one chapter into it, I think. And I thought, oh, my God, if the rest of these chapters are this good. I was praying they were. I was hoping it wasn't like one good chapter. And it was there were so many gems in that book. And I started rereading it again, as I was saying last week. And it's just such it. You know, whether it's a movie or a book or a school program or whatever it is, you can tell when someone has really put their all into something. Mm -hmm. And that book, Renewing You, I just felt it was so, so heartfelt, so thoroughly put together. And I just we're going to get into stress in a second. But one of the things I wanted to um, just so you could briefly tell the people when you were writing that book, you got hit with a ton of stress, didn't you? And in particular, there was one story in there that I just read and I thought, oh my God, that if I was with my kids, that would have been tough. You were headed toward Disney World, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the story I'm referring to? See, tell the audience that story because it just, as a parent, I read that and I went, oh, brother, that's tough. Anyway, welcome and, and go ahead, Father. Tell that story. Uh, thank thanks, thanks, Robert, for again for having me on the on your on your podcast and just the opportunity to be with you and your all your your friends and yeah, I mean, renewing you was was just us, my wife and I, um, just being very authentic. Um, sometimes people think that a priest and psychologist should have everything in the right order and be you know be right. able to answer all the questions. And we just renewing you is really a book that was born out of a great deal of struggle uh, and, and as you said, stress. But to answer your question specifically, yeah, we were we were on our way to Disney World. We had just come back from a trip. Um, I had just come back from a trip to Africa. And on the way um, to Disney World, the kids had wanted to go down to uh, go there. They, our kids at that time were very, very young. And while on their way down there, um, my sister had called us and said, it really in a screaming voice, just very frantic, uh, Nick, you need to get back now. Dad has just had a stroke. You need to get back. And my dad was in great shape by that time, great health. Um, and it was that moment that of her of just hearing her voice and um, just simply having our kids who were very close to my dad say, "What what's going up? What's going on with Baba?" You know, uh, my dad's what they would uh, with uh, their uh, grandfather, and just being able not only to dealing with that, but also in my mind thinking, "Oh my gosh." my world that I knew um, has just stopped. It, everything has changed in that one moment. Um, and so it was an extraordinarily stressful drive back. We were rushing, obviously probably not going the speed limit, um, just out of fear for losing my father. Um, and so that day would usher in the next, you know, seven to eight months of, uh, of cancer treatment and just a great deal of difficulties that were going on in our family, not to mention, you know, just, just the general stress that people have in their own lives. So renewing you really became therapeutic for us, as I've shared with mm -hmm. you in the past, um, in that we were able to kind of put to put our thoughts, our stresses, our ideas about what we're going through and believing that most people are probably going through something very similar in their life. Obviously, the storyline may change and the dates will change, but the impact that it has on the body, on the soul, on the mind doesn't. Um, and, it, and, and every one of us are impacted by it. So we wanted to write a book that we hope will provide some renewal to people's lives uh, in those darkest days. How long was it from that moment to your father passing away? Uh, probably, um, uh, I would say probably about eight months, eight to nine months. And then um, and then Roxanne's father would pass away about eight months after that. So within a year and, and a few months, both of our fathers um, had passed away. And so um, we, it, we just didn't know what to do with the emotions because... You know, when when people deal with stress, obviously there's there's certain small levels of stress, and I, I don't want to minimize it, but there's some stress that's you know I have an ex, you know I have a job requirement done, I have a a school paper done uh, to be done, 
And then there's the more the prolonged stress, the stress of dealing with someone that's got an illness, or maybe you yourself have an illness, um, the stress of being in an, a toxic environment or in a toxic relationship, things that can weigh heavily on your body. And so when you're going through those times of stress, it's very easy to feel like the earth underneath you has been rocked and shaken. And that's definitely what we felt like. And again, that's really where we felt that we needed to do something with that, because if not, we would just kind of get boggled down into the quicksand of depression, uh, sadness, you know, frustration, all the emotions that all of us can experience. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Robert, but I do want to kind of share with your listeners today is that that's the thing about stress. People don't often have realize this, but, you know, in some studies that I've studied and found that stress can impact the body some six months after an event has taken place. So what you may be feeling right now, maybe in, um, in physical pains or, um, or just not health, healthy, not where you want to be, may be in part due to some level of stress that, is, uh, that, you happened, that happened months and months ago. Um, the, most, the number one visit to doctor's offices are due to stress and worry. That's how much it's impacting us. You know, it's, it's interesting you say that because I've lost both my parents in the last couple of years. I was telling you the other day, my mom was five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if stress is the right word, but maybe sadness. But it, it really, the impact of that was so heavy. And that's why when I read that you had gone through it and then your wife, Roxanne, had gone through it back to back. Oof, man, that's, that's I mean... Thank God, you know, my both my in-laws are still alive. But uh, uh, no, I understand that. And I, and I, I also a lot of your sermons, in a lot of our conversations, you always say I am a pastor of a church, but that doesn't make me immune to mm -hmm. stress and all these things that I'm talking about. So I kind of wanted the audience to hear that you go through it, number one, mm -hmm. before we start breaking it down into the three things that you talked about, how we get over uh, get through stress. So let me do the, the first one, which I thought was so simple, but I thought it's just brilliant, which was inventory. Mm -hmm. Inventory your stress. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest problems that people face, um, Robert, is they oftentimes will label um, stress as the problem, but they never get to the source of why am I stressed? So I would ask everyone that's tuning in, what is keeping you up at night? Stress is simply the symptom. It's not Cough. the reason. So you, yeah, so it's, it's to identify exactly what is that area of my life that is creating that much stress? Because, you know, I, I think we spend so much time defining it, stress, and never get to the really root of the, of the issue. And so one of the things I oftentimes tell people to do is, you know, at certain times of the day, when people come to me just for counsel or guidance, I'll say, I want you to write down what you've been thinking about at 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 5 p.m. Just simply take the time to think about what you have been thinking about. Um, and I've used oftentimes this analogy of a triangle. Um, I, you know, if your life was in a triangle and that life, that, that triangle symbolizes the areas of your life that you're stressed about, what would be at the very top? that's cascading in every part of your life. And we talked about this, I think on the previous show, but what's at the tip of that triangle. So one of the things that, 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 you, that we, that I encourage everyone to do is, is truly pay attention, pay attention to what you're not only what you're stressed about, but more importantly, what you're thinking about. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that for us, you know, when our dads were going through a difficult time is, you know, I never really realized how it was impacting not only my own personal life, but how it was impacting me psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and so one of the things that I would encourage your listeners to be aware of is that when they're studying, taking that inventory is also looking in those areas. How is stress impacting my relationship with Christ, with God? Am I spending more time with him or less? Because studies show that when you are stressed, mismanaged stress, if you will, keeps us from God. In other words, we tend to run away from God than to be close to him because we try to right. manage it on our own. Right. Uh, how is it impacting my own physical health? Am I eating the right foods? Am I taking the time to go for that walk? Or am I withdrawing myself? Um, how is it impacting me socially? 
people that are stressed oftentimes withdraw and will manage it in, in a couple of different ways. One way is that they will tend to, you know, express their, that they're stressed and that can come in a way of being irritable, uh, frustrated. They snap at things very easily. They make big things that are things that are not that big of a deal, but they'll make that. Or the flip side um, is, is that they will internalize it. They withdraw, they get quiet. All of those ways obviously are unhealthy. And uh, I would argue that the one that's internalizing is probably even, even unhealthier, if you will, amongst that. But yeah. that's why I'm saying, so take that time, be, be diligent about this, that at 9, 12, and 5, reflect on what is keeping me up at night and pay attention to the tip of that triangle. You got to be able to, to identify what that is. Father, well, didn't you also, in that sermon I was listening to, I think you said, when you pray, ask God to show you what it is you're, you're stressing about. Is that, am I correct? Yes. I mean, I, I, so, many, so much of what we talk about um, is that uh, when we pray is we oftentimes are telling God what he needs us to do, uh, what, what he needs <laughs> uh, him to right. do for us. You know, it's like, almost right. like, you know, God, it's your to-do list for the week. You know, and, um, and I need you to make sure it's done this way, solve this ha in this situation and by this time. Um, but I think that um, I oftentimes tell us to people, and this is something I, that uh, is something that's very dear to my own heart. And that is, you know, prayer is not just about what we're telling God, what, what we want him to do. It's listening to what he wants us to do. Um, and we can't do that if we're not in a moment of just simply of stillness and of just simply allowing him to say, hey, God, speak in my heart. Reveal to me the areas that I am struggling with. What do I need to be handing off to you today that I'm not? What am I trying to hold on to that I'm not? Uh, this is kind of a little bit more, a little bit deeper. But if you want to get even more practical um, with this, Robert, is I oftentimes tell people if you spend more, more than 10 minutes to 30 minutes on a topic and it does not change the topic, then you are trying to manage something that does not need to be in your in your own bucket. It needs to be in God's control bucket. Huh. And as I need to be, in many ways, you're like a basketball player. You got to know what to throw into your bucket and what to throw into Christ's bucket. And for many of us, we're doing Christ's job. We're trying to do what we think is Christ's job. And oftentimes God's just simply saying, can you simply get out of the way? Let me help you with this problem. Um, but oftentimes because we're trying to micromanage our, our micromanage God, and as a result, it never brings us satisfaction. So another litmus test, it doesn't always work all the time. So don't, I'm not trying to minimize our stresses, but if you find yourself stressed and it's taking, and, and it's, and the, the ability for you to try to resolve that stress does not get any better between 10 to 30 minutes. The chances are you're trying to control something that's, that's not. And just to go a little bit deeper into this pool of faith is that stress is a tool of the, of the enemy. I would argue it creates, it's because, what it does is it fatigues us. Interesting. It's, wow. it, it, it tires us out. And so the enemy will always speak the loudest when we are the weakest. So when you're tired, it's when he goes to work. That's why study after study, even independent of Christianity, study after study, even just talking about our own physical health, when we are tired, we will compromise on our morals and values. We would say that we'll compromise in committing sins. We will compromise on our um, on our ability to communicate with other people in a in a, in a healthy way. Um, we can't hear what people are trying to tell us. We would say as Christians that we can't hear God speaking to us. That's how powerful tiredness and fatigue is. So be cautious. If the stress does not allow yourself to put a comma to do something actionable, then some of us are dying in the stress, not realizing there's an action that God wants us to take with it. So don't die in the don't die in the subject. There's still a comma to go something further with it. You know what I thought of this morning when I was thinking about all this was uh, the Matthew um, the quote in Matthew, which was "Come, come uh, to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, mm. and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I to me that is Christ saying." give it to me, Let, give it to me and I'll take care of it. And I have found that the closer I am to Christ, the more I'm in reading the Bible, the more I'm praying, the more I'm thinking about him, the more it's part of my day, 
that that stress goes down because he repeatedly is saying what I just read, just give it to me. I'll take it. I was saying this to my wife last night. It was like if, if someone gave you a credit card and said, you can go to the mall and it's not just one shop. You can go to any shop you want and put anything on this card and it's paid for. You don't even have to repay it. This is what I think God is saying to us is here's a credit card for all your anxiety, your stress. It's got my name on it. I will take care of it. Just give it to me. Mm-hmm. But what happens is I think when we're not reading the Bible, when we're not going to church, when we're not in prayer, we tend to go jump in ourselves. And, and that's when I think all that anxiety starts. One of the hardest things I've been trying to do is when a problem hits me is to simply say, on a scale of one to 10, Bob, what if you kept this at a one? Can you try and keep this at a one, this problem? And God knows I've had some dingers. Um, Can you keep it at a one and literally look at it, do what you can, and then give it to God and say, I'm not going to worry about it. Very hard to do. But the few times I've done it, I've been amazed at the results. Usually the type A comes in there and goes, I'll take care of it. And then God, you can help later. You know what I mean? I mean, I think that that's for all of us. And it's, you know, it's obviously easy to talk, you know, in these settings where, you know, we're, we're talking about stress, um, but we all go through it and we all have certain default settings that we do, that we have, just like there's a default setting on a computer Well, there's a default setting on our own minds. And so for many of us, we kind of have to change that default setting, the way that our minds process things. And for many of us, I, I would argue that we've kind of downloaded some really unhealthy viruses, if you will, just to kind of use this analogy to build on it. And the way that we do that, one of the ways that we ha- download a, a better software, if you will, is when we're spending time with God. I mean, yeah. you know, the word peace is one of the most common used words in the entire Bible. Why did God spend so much time talking about peace? It's because, you know, that we would struggle with not having it. That, that you know, the very first comments that he says to his disciples after he rises from the dead, this is after the... Peace, people. Like he was telling us, hey, look, be at peace. Why? Because they were stressed. Yeah. They were stressed. They didn't know where, you know, was this, was he going to rise from the dead? Was he going to fulfill their promises? They were scared about um, whether or not they, people were going to the Romans were going to come after them and kill them. I mean, they had all the emotions of fear, worry, anxiety, things that we all have, um, different, different storylines, but we all experience. And his first statement was, was not here I am, everyone. I have. Peace be with you. Right. Peace be with you. Also, Father, to add on to that, mm-hmm. I, when I was reading, and I don't know if I've got this right, but you saw that that anxiety, that trepidation. They were locked up in the room. I've always been fascinated by when that went away. When did it go away? And Peter, I think it was 3,000 people. Were, it was when they got the Holy Spirit. That is when they, they took off, and it but we have the Holy Spirit. After you've been baptized, you have that Holy Spirit. So it's within you to get rid of that stress. God's within you. And I think that's, if you if you are like that flame on a stove igniting that, I think that's the, one of the big keys. So Yeah, uh, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is I think it's, you know, it's, you know, if, when we read the rest of the New Testament, I mean, obviously Paul was not in that upper room. He wasn't part of the 12 disciples. But he speaks very candidly about his own struggle with stress and depression. I mean, he says that at one point that he um, that he disdained life itself um, because he was through all the pressures that he was under in the stress. Um, Peter talks about uh, he says in the first Peter, it says, um, cast all of your anxiety on Christ because he cares. And um, it's because he, too, knew what stress was. So I think that. You know, one of the things I would just caution is that, you know, Christ reveals to us and wants and yearns to have a relationship with us every day. It's not a one and done. Um, it's a constant conversation that we have with him. And remember that if your default setting, if you're if you struggle, if one of your persistent sins, as the Bible talks about them, is stress and worry. Um, well, then just know that, that that's going to be the one of the ways that the enemy will play on you. That'll be one of his little tools to use against you and will create thoughts and behaviors, and even events that will just kind of create that um, that level of uh, anxiety. Of, 
of anxiety in your life. It's interesting, and then we can continue on. But I, yes. it's interesting when, when you know, hear Christ, you know, in the Bible, uh, being baptized by John the Baptist, um, you know, is about ready to go into the wilderness. Is on, you know, it's just revealed to us what this, what it means to be one with with God. Um, the it's at that time that the devil comes and attacks him. And he attacks him, and we all know most of us know the stories of, of, of him being attacked and uh, with these three different offers that the, that the enemy gives to him. Right. But what's very interesting, Robert, is that when he, at the very last time when he you know cast off the, the devil, it says that the enemy, the devil, leaves him. He says, I'll be back again. And waits for until an opportune time. Yeah. So he, he never, this is something that so oftentimes people don't just, Kind of glance over, but he never leaves Christ. He's simply right. he, he's waiting for another opportune time. Stress or mismanaged stress, I would add, uh, because stress is going to happen. But mismanaged stress is that opportune time. Yeah, you know, I I, I remember reading that that part, and also too, I when I was reading later, and when Jesus said that the devil came and asked me, he was going to sift you. Mm -hmm. It just gave me chills because I thought there he is. He he's coming back again, and he's in. It was he, he. You're right. He is waiting for that opportune moment to jump in. All right, I want to go to so inventory is number one for everybody out there. All right, that's inventory. Find out what it is. Number two, which I love also, keep perspective. I thought that was great. You want to enunciate on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that we oftentimes do when we have a stressful moment is that our brains tend to kind of um, everything in our thoughts become focused so much in on that. So that that issue, that topic that we're stressed about um, becomes all that we can think about. And, and this is where we get the sleepless nights, the unable to eat or overeating, uh, just the, the, the general fatigue that we can all go through the day. And one of the things I oftentimes tell people is keep the right perspective. I mean, the reality is, is that Yes, God never promised us that we were going to have an easy life. I, I always get concerned when I hear pastors give this kind of Kool-Aid Christianity where everything is just oh so sweet and everything is so good. And if you just do this, this is going to happen. That's not reality. I mean, the cross was not Kool-Aid. It was not easy. It, you know, so I oftentimes tell people, you know, and this is actually something that I heard someone tell me once before, um, is that uh, Christianity is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that it's hard. The Bible says, Christ says this, take up your cross and follow me. So we need to, A, expect that we're going to have difficult times. Christ tells us that on the night before he's going to go to the cross, he says, take heart to his disciples. You're going to go through a lot of difficult times. You're going to have stress, but take heart because I've already overcome the world. It's John mm -hmm. 16, verses 33. Now, he hadn't risen from the dead. He hadn't even been on the cross. The disciples didn't even know anything about the cross. They didn't even know what was going to happen three hours or 10 hours later. And yet he's already saying, I've already overcome the world. Mm -hmm. So keep the right perspective in A, God has this. We're on a winning team. I mean, we're in a win-win situation. Whether we are on this earth or we're going into the kingdom of heaven, we're on a winning team. I mean, Christ destroyed death to give us eternal life. In a, and so a, being on that winning team, but I would also add, too, is that there are many people that are out in this world that would um, that would love to have the life that we have right now. I mean, there are people that right now that um, are struggling um, to pay their bills. Um, there are people that are living without a roof. Uh, there's people that make a minimal amount of money. We watched several weeks back in um, on the island in Hawaii, these people that lost everything, all their home, uh, all their wealth. Um, just today I was visiting a, a, a member of our community that, you know, several weeks ago was healthy. And today he's in his mid fifties and he's dying of cancer. You know, this is, you know, let's just keep the right perspective on, on, on what's, um, and it's really all about how we, how we view life and how we see life. I love when King David in the book of Psalms, it says, yeah. this is one of his prayers. He says, Lord, teach me to number my days. So, You've heard this thing. If you know, if I'm if I'm if I'm healthy, then I'm wealthy. In other All words, right. if everything is okay, um, I'm too stressed to be blessed. I mean, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Um, I, I just have to keep the right perspective. Not that they don't exist. We're not whitewashing what we could be dealing with, but what we're saying is that at, in the end, there's a happy ending, 
in the end, no matter what we're stressed about right now, it all ends okay. Because Christ- I, I love what you said. Heaven is heaven. Earth is earth. You want to just expound on that for a second? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, one of the things I was sharing in that, in the message you were talking, that you're referring to, um, uh, Bob, was I was saying that, you know, I think a lot of times people struggle, especially in this country, but really around the world where, where you have uh, an abundance of wealth, is that we can, we can buy into this lie that earth is our homeland. Yeah. That everything ends with earth. And you even hear people sometimes say, well, you only live once, you know, live it up. But that is one of the biggest lies that we've been told. We don't live once. We live twice. And the life that we're going to after this life, we're going to live there much longer than the life that we're living in now. And St. Paul writes about this. He actually warns us about not making earth our homeland. He says this in the book of Philippians. Very Not that many chapters in this book. If you can read it all in an evening. But he says those who make the earth as their citizenship of this earth have become, and he's very forthright when he says this, have become enemies to Christ. In other words, mm -hmm. our homeland is not earth. Heaven is. And what I shared in that sermon, which I hope, you know, hopefully will inspire some of you, is that um, is stop making earth be heaven. Earth yeah. is earth. Heaven is heaven. Yeah. Um, and just be very cautious about that. Again, keeping that right perspective, that if we put all of our investments in earth, Earth is going to disappoint us. It's the wrong yeah. investment to make. You know, I'm, I'm going to go on to the third point in a second, but I just want to button that up. Uh, my wife is a therapist like uh, your, your wife as well. And at the end of the night, we'll eat dinner and she'll say, we'll say, how was your day? And she'll say, oh, I had such and such and such case happen and so forth. And I, I will tell you the majority of the times after she finishes, she says, how was your day? And I, I'll get up and I'll say, I have no problems. Right, right. I have no problems. I'm so aware of what I see around me and what I, what people are going through. Um, man, I, I try to my best to keep keep the mouth closed. You, I, when I see what you know, when I saw the the video we did a couple of weeks ago um, for your trip, how can anybody how can anybody complain after you watch something like that? You think water? Mm -hmm. Water is incredible. So, all right. Um, number three, so we've got inventory, keep perspective, and the last one is keep your eyes on God. Yeah, yeah. So this is the other um, keep, if you will, and that and that is, you know, it's uh, like I like I was telling you. So often we tend to compartmentalize God, and 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 sometimes if we're not careful, we tend to think we put God as uh, I was sharing this yesterday and or a couple of days ago. You know, we kind of put God on a as a to do list, or like He's an item on a piece of paper, um, and it's like something that we have to take care of, or that we we have to do. God doesn't want to be the piece of paper; He wants to be the paper mm -hmm. in a very elementary kind of way. Everything lands on Him. Everything goes through Him. Everything is about Him. And so, what I want you to remember: this is something that I, when I, in doing research, um, I heard someone put this this way. I thought it was just a great, you know, he broke down the word stress. S T R E S S. And um, I loved how it said it. it says stress, S T R S, is someone trying to repair every situation solo. Someone right. trying to repair every situation solo. Right. Like you can do it on your own. So faith is about giving, is about working in unison with Christ. And so I, I you know, I, I, I use this again going back to the book of Philippians. It says this. Um, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The Lord is near. Do not be stressed or anxious about anything. So mm -hmm. notice that he's using the word, he's saying rejoice, which means the, the prefix re means to return. So return to that joy. And he doesn't just say it once. He says it again, return to that joy. So if you didn't get it this first time, return to the joy don't be anxious or stressed about anything. So what you need to know is that the word anxious or anxiety in the Greek language, of which St. Paul writes in the Greek language, even though he was a Jewish man, he writes much like most of the New Testament written in Greek. Um, the word is merimna, and the word merimna literally means to tear something apart, to separate. So when we get stressed, it separates us from Christ. 
it separates from the people in our lives. It separates us from um, our, our purpose in, our, in, in this world. So when I talk about leaning on God, it means that I'm not running away from God during those moments of stress. I'm getting on my knees and I'm going to God during those times. I'm returning. I'm rejoicing. I'm going back to Christ, realizing that he is the only one that can provide comfort um, uh, comfort in my life. And, uh, you know, kind of building on that too, Bob, I oftentimes share, you know, it's something I tell myself a lot because I'm not immune from stress. I, I deal with it all the time, is recognizing that part of my, that that phrase, that passage of faith without works is dead, it's not just talking about my actions of physically going out and making my faith, you know, alive. It's also making my relationship with Christ alive. That work of connecting to Christ, spending time with him, yeah. being still with him, that is also part of that faith without works is dead. I've got to be in that constant relationship with him. So all throughout the day, it, it may se seem kind of silly, but I'm in a constant conversation because sometimes I don't like... I don't know how to handle something. It's beyond my understanding. And people are leaning on us for understanding or guidance. And so, God, just give me the words. Or, God, let me give this anxiety, the stress to you. Because on my own, I know mm -hmm. what my track record is. And my track record is not great. I need God to be in that. You know, I think, uh, Roxanne, your wife, Dr. Roxanne, in the book, there was a story where she was talking to somebody. I can't remember who it was. But he said to her, I'm talking to God even as I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. And I understood that there is a, a degree to what you and I are discussing, which I've tried to get to. It's, it's, it is tough. But throughout the day, it's not like you pray and then you leave God in the bedroom and then you go about your day and you come back. I have found it fascinating when I'm out with friends, when I'm uh, in business, I can sometimes feel like something's getting anxious within me. And then I will immediately pray and bring God into that moment. Mm. And I feel it come back down again. And I think that's, there is a, a level that I hope someday to get to, which is it's God all day. It's God mm -hmm. when you're, it's God when you're talking to your wife, it's God when you're calling the kids at college or at work, it's God when you're, um, you're doing work. That is, that's what I think you're talking about. A constant companionship and, and, and person with you, uh, which is tough because we tend to, you know, go back and forth and leave them, leave God and come back and sometimes leave them for long stretches of time. Absolutely. I mean, right. And, and what we don't, we kind of like don't realize that this is all part of that spiritual warfare that we, that St. Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. I mean, this is a spiritual battle. And, you know, sometimes we're always thinking of our, the spiritual battle to be something that we could see, you know, the, 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 the enemy with the pitchfork and the red costume, right. but sometimes it manifests itself obviously in other ways, stress being one of them because it, it weakens us. It, it, it you know, um, and busyness. I mean, a lot of times, you know, when you look at the areas that, that actually cause the most amount of stress, it's time, it's money um, and relationships. Those represent the, probably the three biggest areas of stress and, um, that we, that we all experience. And, you know, with regards to the time, I mean, uh, we talk about this a lot, you know, if the enemy can keep us so busy in our life, his goal is to keep us so busy that we don't have time to spend time with Christ. And we talked about this, I think last time, but yeah. you know, yeah. the, the word of, you know, bound under Satan's yoke, you know, busy, B-U-S-Y, bound under Satan's yoke. I mean, just knowing how he works. And, and again, those, so for some of us, that's our default setting. Um, and then money. Some of us are, are our whole perspective in life is again making earth heaven. I want to make right. as much money as I can, and I want to you know have this nice house. And I'm not saying I'm against having a you know working hard and having and being goal oriented and wanting to be your best. But there's nothing wrong with having money as long as money doesn't have you. And for a lot of people, we don't have the discernment to be able to distinguish the difference. And for a lot of people, that's what our goal is. Our God is money. Um, and so we have to be very careful. And then relationships. Um, sometimes we're putting um, more effort and time in relationships that do not benefit us and really neglecting the relationships that do benefit us. You know, so, you know, uh, I mentioned it was my, my mom's five year um, memorial and I, I went to the graveyard. And one of the things that struck me, you know, I, I was there and saw the plate over you know her grave. 
-hmm. And I walked around and looked at several of the other plates that were there. And what I told my wife later, the thing that struck me, when you read those plates, it never said here was a rich man or here was a poor man. Mm -hmm. It never said this is what this person did, invented this. The majority, and if not 90, if not more said, beloved father, devoted husband, devoted wife, mm -hmm. loving son. It was really about just that, how you were as a human being. Mm -hmm. There was nothing on there that told me anything else. And I thought, it's funny when you boil down a person's life at the end, that is how they chose to be remembered. Not for inventing something, not for how much money they made, mm -hmm. but what kind of a person they were. Um, I want to end this with um, two things, if I could. One was, if you could talk about, I, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Kendr Kendrin Valley, and how that when I when I was hearing that, I went, oh, that's that that's that you're you're dying. You know, you hear that when people are dying, but you had a different perspective on it. Number one, and then if you have the uh, Maximus quote, I thought we could wrap it up with that, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is that uh, you know what I had shared. Um, about the Kitron Valley is that, you know, it's interesting when you're reading the scriptures um, that um, right before Christ is, uh, Christ would oftentimes go into the Garden of Gethsemane um, to pray. That was his kind of like his prayer house, his prayer space. Um, and the Bible says this in a very subtle phrase. It simply says that, that, that Christ would cross over the Kitron Valley to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and yeah. The Kidron Valley, what's very interesting about it, some historians have maintained uh, through just archaeological research and findings, as well as historical um, just knowledge uh, and research, is that the Kidron Valley would run all the way under the temple of uh, Solomon's temple, right under the massive large altar table that they would have. And on the altar table, again, this is, uh, so this is what some historians have maintained. There's some discrepancy about this, but for the sake of just the, of what we're talking about. But what was interesting is that they have like a large circle on the very top of that altar table. And when they would sacrifice these tens of thousands of lambs at Passover, um, the blood would go down that hole that was on that altar table and would run through the Kidron Valley. And so one of the, some historians have maintained that here Christ, why that, why that verse is in there is that here he was crossing over the river of blood where the innocent lambs were being slaughtered and he would go into the garden of Gethsemane. And that's where he would pray that final prayer um, where he would sweat drops of blood. He would um, be in, talk about stress that he yeah. was under so much so that it impacted him. But I've oftentimes added to that thinking to myself here, he was, you know, crossing over this Kidron Valley. If that was the case where the blood from these lambs were going through this Kidron Valley, these innocent lambs, well, here, Jesus Christ, the very first phrase that John the Baptist says about Christ, he doesn't say, hey, everyone, there's Jesus over there. He says, behold, the Lamb of God, and that Christ was called the Lamb. He was an innocent Lamb, and perhaps maybe Christ, as he was crossing over this Kidron Valley, maybe why this verse is there, is that as he saw this blood going down, that he knew that he was the next one up. That he was the, next one up. the verse that we're talking about is, and you know better than me, um, though I go through the valley of the darkness, how you were referring to is a king. David? Right, 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 right. And, and so um, in Psalm 23, um, uh, a very popular uh, um, uh, uh, psalm, uh, and psalms are basically were prayers um, for the most part. They were prayers. But one of the things that psalm, the, 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 the parable, the, the, um, the psalm about the shepherd, the good shepherd, and it says, Lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear. And then it goes on to say that because you are my rock, that you were by my side. You're always with me. You're my rod. And King David writes this while being in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem itself, um, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, it's a very hilly place, a lot of caves. It's very mountainous, um, very hilly. And, um, and what he was saying is that as he's writing this, you can help, but he was, as he was writing this, that, that he didn't know what was around the corner. I mean, at, 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 in the evening, it was pitch black. You couldn't see your hand in front of you. Um, he didn't know if there was robbers there. He didn't know if there were um, uh, people that were going to be uh, animals that could, that could kill him. Um, I mean, there's a myriad of things that could have created the stress that we're talking about earlier. Um, 
But I love that phrase that, Lord, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear because you're with me. And when we walk through life, whether it be the fear of a, an event or fear of what could happen in the future or the stress that comes along with it, I'm not going to fear because you, Christ, are right here with me. Yeah, I love that. Um, all right, let's wrap it up with uh, Maximus. And it, briefly, I never knew about him having his arm. And if you want to go into that and then tell what he wrote about stress, I just thought it was a great way to wrap this up. I think it's important. For, thank you, um, Bob. I, I think it's very important for, for your listeners, or, you know, especially those of you that are, you know, if you're trying to go deeper in your walk of faith, in your Christian faith, it's great to study, you know, the 2,000 years of Christianity. Sometimes we just kind of live in the here and now of Christianity, but we don't oftentimes look at, you know, what was the Holy Spirit doing for 2,000 years? Um, and then uh, there is a, um, a book or a volume of book called the Philokalia. And the word Philokalia is basically means love of the beautiful. And it basically has these writings, these beautiful writings of saints um, that are in um, predominantly in the Orthodox uh, Church, of which I'm part of. Um, but it, it basically has these different sayings and they deal with a, a myriad of topics that a lot of what we're still dealing with today. That's why it's so important to kind of look at how they did it, their life and maybe we can learn how they lived their life so that we can model it more. Um, and on a side note, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about this. It says, since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Well, who are those witnesses? They're, they're the saints. So the saints of our church are our loved ones who have also gone before us um, that are in the stadium of your life. So St. Maximus is one. And he, didn't, he lived during a time in which there was a great deal of debate about who is Christ. I mean, a lot of things that we take for granted now was Christ fully God. And fully man, um, what were his wills? Was he was he did he have a godly will, a human will? Things that may seem kind of foreign to us right now, but back then those were major topics and major issues of um, debate. He stood up against people that believed that he that Christ only had uh, one will, that he only had one purpose. Um, and as a result, back in those days where there was a great deal of friction both in and outside of the church, he was punished for that so much so that he would have his arm his uh, his arm uh, cut off so that he wouldn't be able to write. He would write beautiful treaties about what that meant and how we should understand who Christ is. And it's also because he was a very eloquent speaker. They had they had severed his tongue. Um, so when we talk about how, you know, um, there's a phrase that we use in the, in the American culture that freedom isn't free. Well, our faith didn't come free. Um, someone paid for it. Obviously, that's in Christ. But there were people, the saints who followed Christ, who loved Christ, who believed in everything about him, that as we know from the Bible, as well as the tradition of Christianity, many of them died horrific deaths. Um, and so Maximus, um, although he wasn't killed, was definitely tortured. But talk about someone that experienced stress. He writes um, a couple of uh, beautiful statements uh, that really speak to me. One of, the, one of my favorite quotes that he writes, is says, um, he says that being a Christian is an entirely new way of being a human. I love that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about this, like the old, the old man is gone. Like when I'm, when I'm on fire for Christ, that old Nick Lowe, it's done. That page has been turned. Doesn't mean that I don't have those certain struggles that that persistent sin, but I'm not going back to chapter one or chapter mm -hmm. two. I'm in the chat, the new chapters that God's creating me for me. I love that. It's an entirely way, new way of being a human. But in, he talked a little bit about stress and keeping in mind, arm severed, mouth uh, cut, or his tongue cut. This is what he said. Um, and I'm just going to read it for you. It says, he says this. He says, an evil which is expected in the future is called fear. He calls fear and anxiety and stress an evil. And one experienced in the present is called distress. In other words, if we're constantly being in fear and stressed now, it's distressed. And we're being distressed. But one striving to be that entirely new way of being a human, one striving to be a, a Christian, on the other hand, remains dispassionate in the face of these evils, since he is always united to God and is detached from all that happens in his life. In other words, because I'm in, I'm in a relationship with God, I'm not going to allow myself to be in a relationship with stress or a relationship with fear. Um, and 
you're in a, it's just a beautiful way of just reminding ourselves of, of a that this is an evil that that it's a it's a, that if we're not, if mismanaged it becomes a spiritual battle in our own life and it impacts us in in all these different ways that we've been talking about but not that we're not going to face it we're going to face it because God tells us we're going to face it but because I'm connected to Christ I realize that he's got it like that old song that we say with you know he's got the whole world in his hands well he's got all of us in his hands we're on the winning side and we just need to continue to live a life that uh, that fulfills God's dream in our life. Brilliant, fantastic. I, I, I have one small question, and I, I, it's just it's a personal question because it's usually where I get hung up on this, and I promise one we'll after this. Um, I sometimes get stuck at where I've done my what I when I what I need to do where I leave off and, and let God do what he's going to do. In other words, you can't want, if I'm going to go make a movie, I can't just sit, sit back and say, God, I hope you make the movie for me. Where it gets convoluted sometimes for me is where do I stop and say, I've given it everything I have and, and, and I, and not worry about it. There's, there's, it's a tough, there's a tough for me to know where that road ends. Do you know what I'm I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, I do. I think, I mean, I, I think everyone, Bob could relate to exactly what you're saying and knowing what that is and knowing when it is. But one of the things I would say is instead of giving like the specific answer, because I think it will vary from people. It's just going back to what we talked about earlier is just knowing you and knowing your science that when you find, when you look and study yourself and you see that you're, that you yourself are getting more and more distant from Christ, that you're not presenting it to him. When you see it impacting you, in the way in which you communicate with your family, your wife, your children, um, at work, how you communicate, then these are the signs. These are the the symptoms to the cold. They so sometimes we may not always have the exact answer. Okay, at this point, you need to stop doing this and give it to God, because that may be very. And I would argue that you know God wants us to be co. The Bible says us that we are co-ministers with Him. So God yearns for us to work. He never decides to say. Hey, just give it to me, and then you go run off and do take, tackle some other problem. That's never. We're we're working in this together. There's a liturgy, as we would say. There's a working together, but recognizing that when I, if I, if I'm, if I, when I study myself, when I take a, when I take a step back, am I? Is it keeping me from spending time with God? Is it keeping me from communicating in a positive way? Oh, um, um, those kind of things. That those those would be great little cues for us to know. Hey. This is what this, these are signs that I'm trying to control something that's really out of my control. Yeah. And I, I would add, and then on this saying, Father, for me, I found, you know, my wife and I, we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. That's all. Awesome. We've known each other 32 years. And it's interesting if you said to me, the day we met, would you trust her with everything? It's, well, I just met her. I, I, you know, give me a little time. After a year, two years, I trust her more. After 32 years, if my wife tells me, because we've known each other two years before that we got married, if she tells me at five o'clock, I'm going to be here and I'll have this and that, I don't even think about it mm -hmm. because I have so much history with her. I know that if she tells me I'm going to do this. It's done. I don't, I don't get anxious over it. And I compare that to the relationship with Christ. When you've developed years of a relationship with him, and in my life, I could tell you instant after instant after instant that he has come through for me. And I never forget those. Mm -hmm. Often during my week, I will go back randomly if I'm taking a walk and say, I just want to thank you. And I'll come up with 10 to 15 examples in my life where he's come through with something where I needed help. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying this for is for the people out there, if you build up that life and that history with Christ, what we're talking about becomes easier because you know over and over and over again, Christ will always come through. May not in the time, may not in the way. <laughs> it may take years before you understand, oh, my God, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. That's, for me, is how that relationship has been built over decades. And what we're talking about has become easier. Last word, you. <laughs> Go ahead. It's always it's, I mean, I think, I think that you, you summed it up beautifully, Bob. I mean, I just, and I would just encourage your, your listeners just to, you know, to continue to strive, just to strive. I mean, we're all, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying our best, continue to try, but 
lean more on Christ. You know, and if you're like, hey, Father Nick, I'm already close to Christ. I would say just get closer. Like yeah. maybe you've been at the three foot end of the pool and maybe God's been saying, hey, look, go to the five foot pool uh, end of the pool. You, you need to go deeper in your walk of faith. And I promise you, when you lean more into him, um, there's a level of peace that, like the Bible says, there's a peace beyond understanding because yeah. he's got it. He's got it. So true. All right, guys. So here it is again, renewing you. Father, tell them where they can get the book. And then for all of you, if you want to hear all his sermons, Father, tell them his sermons. And also, too, you have to promise me we've got to get Dr. Roxanne on here. Yes. She, they together are, I'm telling you guys. She's the brains just, of the family. You guys have been settling for second best for sure. I know. <laughs> you guys are both wonderful. And when they're together, it's just so, and they have interviews that they've done online. But tell everybody, A, where they can hear uh, you and her, and then also where they can get the book, Renewing You. All right. So thanks. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, so uh, just so you all know, the proceeds from our book um, go towards the, uh, half of it goes towards the American Cancer Society um, and then half of it goes towards outreach ministries that are important to us because our dads passed away from cancer. We wanted to make this book dedicated to them. So you can find the book. You can go to Amazon. It's at Barnes and Noble. It's at Borders. Um, um, uh, you can go you, probably the easiest for you, for most of you would be go to Amazon.com and, and pick uh, the title of the book is Renewing You a priest, a psychologist, and a plan. It's also on Kindle um, if you're uh, interested in doing it that way. And then we also have um, um, daily inspirational messages that you can find and subscribe to by going to our website at um, thelows.com. That's the last name is L-O-U-H-S. So thelows.com forward slash subscribe. And as Bob was mentioning earlier, all of our sermons are archived um, under our YouTube channel. So just go subscribe to the Lowe's YouTube channel, and you'll have access to all of our sermons. And again, you know, we just want to be a source of hope and light. Um, uh, and so there's no strings attached. We just want to encourage people in their walk of faith. And so hopefully this book will do that. And maybe our ministry and our messages will do that just as well. Amen. Father, wonderful. It's It'll be a stress-free day and not for me. And, and all, especially after we got all this working. <laughs> but thank, you, brother. thank you so much. Tell President Ted I say hi. I will. And, uh, thank you. All of you out there, thank you. And I hope this helped you. I got all your comments and thank you so much, everyone that wrote. Greatly appreciate it. And, and uh, everybody have a blessed and stress-free day. God bless you, Father. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, buddy. Take care. God bless you.